Okay, sorry, I'm a little late, everyone. Uh, yeah, entomology calls, but we're here now, uh, and uh, I'm excited to get started. I'll do a quick introduction. I don't want to uh, rob any time from Britt and her wonderful talk. She's going to be giving us a talk today on uh, lizards and the evolution of leglessness. Uh, as we'll see, there are some legless lizards that are actually a little bit different than snakes. There's some cool convergent evolution happening. Um, thanks, everyone, for uh, showing up. Again, sorry, I was a little late. Uh, again, um, Britt, is, is there anything else you'd like to add before you start your talk? Let's see. Uh, thanks, Tristan. Uh, I don't think there's anything else I need to add. Just uh, would like to first say uh, my apologies. I'm using a completely foreign computer to me. So just please give me, um, just please let me ease to that for a second. <laughs> but I don't know, is that interesting? Uh, well, I'll just say quickly, you know, again, Science Under the Stars is uh, our uh, graduate student organized, you know, public lecture series. Britt, of course, is an outstanding graduate student here in the integrative biology department. Uh, at UT, uh, she does outstanding work. She's, you know, working on her thesis soon. Everything is coming along swimmingly. Um, she's simply outstanding. Again, all of our speakers, you know, are, are very uh, well established in their fields and well respected researchers. So we're, we're in for a real treat uh, with Britt this evening. Um, yeah, absolutely. Britt, again, I did, sorry, I'm late. I don't want to take any more time from your, your talk. So please, without further ado, uh, Britt White. All right, well, thank you, Tristan. Um, I hope everyone can hear me just fine. And thanks for coming out to my talk and, and you know, taking the time to show up to an uh, online event that's usually in nature. I really appreciate you being here. Um, and I just, I guess I just wanted to introduce myself a little bit to you guys. Um, so with that, I'll, I will start. I will click the mouse, not press the keypad. All right. So ever since I was a kid, I loved animals. Uh, here, what I want you to pay attention to are my fists, because they aren't fists, they're actually paws. Uh, and I think this is an important detail about me because I was always paying attention to really specific things about animals, even from a young age. I loved being outdoors and in nature. Even as a moody teenager, I couldn't get enough of it. And that brings us to today, um, where I spend as much time as I can outdoors studying lizards. And, you know, I want to preface this uh, with where I came from, because I think that helps understand how I got so obsessed with lizards. This is a photograph of the view from my house, or as we say in New Mexico, Casa. Uh, what you can see here are the beautiful Sandia Mountains. And what's really important and what I'd like you guys to notice is this desert shrubland um, in every direction. You know, it's very dry habitat, perfect for lizards. And so you can also notice how remote this area is. And I kind of grew up in the middle of nowhere, honestly. Um, this is the housing development I grew up at in on the right here. And, th and this is a satellite image, by the way, guys. Uh, what I want you to notice is the housing development is on the edge of four different communities. So in a sense, I'm in the middle of nowhere and in the middle of everywhere. And when I was young, I started having to walk to school from kindergarten until high school. And because of this, I developed 
some really awesome shortcuts through the desert. I'm gonna share my secret shortcut with you guys here. It cuts off six minutes from your walk. If you're coming from my casa all the way to my high school, and the best part about it is it cuts through some of that desert that hasn't really been developed yet. And in fact, when I finally got a car in high school, I drove myself twice before I gave up on it because I missed my daily ritual of seeing lizards in the morning and in the evening. So that's a little bit about myself and I hope you guys kind of understand how somebody could get so obsessed with lizards. Um, so, all right, what are we trying to do here today? What are we gonna learn about lizards? So the ob objectives are, well, first, what is a lizard? What do lizards do? Why study them? And then finally, we're gonna end with the basics of identifying Texas lizards. Um, and just a quick note here, this is a serrated cask-headed lizard from um, the border of Mexico and Guatemala. And I just had to throw this in here. This is an individual I saw when I was out uh, doing some field work, actually. All right, so what is a lizard? I wanted to start off with a little quiz here. I want everyone to take a look at these photos and I want you to ask yourself, do you know which of these are lizards? And think about it. Which of these are lizards? A, B, C or D? You can put it in the chat also if you're really wanting to share your thoughts. Okay, well, I hope some of you got it right. None of them are lizards, actually. That was a pretty mean trick. My apologies. <laughs> um, actually, A is an Eastern newt. B is a tailed frog, one of only two species of frogs with tails in the world. C is a tuatara, which is a Maori word for a really unique animal. And uh, D is a juvenile alligator. So why did I show you all these animals specifically? Well, the top row are amphibians and the bottom row are reptiles. Okay, great. What does that have to do with lizards? Well, the study of amphibians and reptiles and thus lizards is called herpetology. So we, meaning scientists that study herpetology, often sometimes call them herps. And I might slip up if I'm talking about reptiles and amphibians every now and then and say the word herps. So that's just what that means, if you all are wondering. So before I answer that question, what is a lizard? We do kind of need to understand what herps are and why people like herpetologists study them together. Well, most herps share tails, four legs, bumpy skin, or scales. Here is this silly little emoji family tree I made. And I've made a cartoon version here of what scientists like to call a phylogenetic tree. Well, that's kind of a big word. So what we're gonna say instead are evolutionary relationships. 
So this is a tree of evolutionary relationships of these animals. What we have here are frogs, us, turtles, birds, crocodilians, and the dragon is the only thing I could find that could represent a tuatara. Who would think that they wouldn't have a tuatara emoji? So lame. Lizards and snakes. So what we call reptiles are all these animals um, that aren't us, mammals, and frogs. And then frogs are just their own little branch amphibians. Well, okay, that's kind of a weird group. You can see that the group doesn't actually fit all in a box together. And, you know, that's mainly because of historical reasons. People often thought that things without fur and feathers, well, they had to be related. But as you can see here, birds are actually in with the reptiles. So despite what historical biologists think, uh, thought, the icky animals don't just fit together and aren't the most related to one another. All right, well, what's different about reptiles from amphibians? Well, reptiles actually can lay eggs away from water. They're freed, as one may say, from being near a water source to reproduce. But what about lizards? Well, lizards are different because of their skulls, their brains, heart, a lot of their internal organs are different from the other reptiles. Um, and that's really what separates them from Tuatara. You know, we saw the Tuatara and it looked so similar to a lizard. I'm sure some of y'all really got tricked by that one. And that's because it does kind of look like a lizard on the outside. But on the inside, there are a lot of these traits that are different. Um, even how tails are regrown in those two animals differs. So this brings us to our next question. Why are lizards and snakes different? All right, so we're on our tree, placing ourselves with this gecko emoji and this snake emoji. What's different about lizards? Well, lizards tend to have eyelids, four legs, skulls that are quite a bit different or at least different in some cases from snakes. And what I mean by that are lizards tend to have like highly um, ossified skulls or skulls that are fixed, they don't move a lot. And why is that? Well, you know, snakes tend to have really malleable skulls so that they can eat large prey items and really open their mouth wide. So to do that, you need to have a skull that is uh, malleable and can move. So that's one, an, one way that lizards and snakes are a little bit different. And tail regrowth. Uh, despite what you might think, there are some snakes that do lose their tails and regrow them. But for the most part, snakes don't actually do that. Most lizards do though, but some don't. <laughs> Okay. Oops. I gave away the secret. All right. So I wanted to show you guys this um, and give you a moment to think about what we've just learned. And if you had to guess, I hope you didn't see the answer. Oopsies. <laughs> Please look at A, B, C and D, and think about which of these is not a lizard. Okay, well, if you said B, or you saw the answer, because I gave it away, you were right. A is actually 
uh, Sarone's glass lizard. Uh, B is the banded water snake. C is a um, leaf tailed gecko. And then D is a five lined flying dragon. Yes, dragons are real. <laughs> All right, so this is all to say, okay, so maybe lizards don't fit into a box perfectly. And they, it would be really hard for them to. So with that said, I'm not going to talk about snakes, even though you could call them a lizard. And what I suggest is to you, if you wanna learn more about snakes, is to go and see uh, Tom Marshall's Science Under the Stars talk from earlier this year. Um, Tom is uh, an expert in snakes of Texas, and I think you would really enjoy his talk and you would learn a lot about the lizards around here, or sorry, the snakes around here. <laughs> okay, so today, so that means today I'm going to focus on lizards or whatever we call lizards. Since you saw that biologically snakes and lizards are, yeah, kind of the same thing. But let's just pretend we're only gonna talk about lizards today. So lizards are really diverse and that's not even including snakes. There are over 7,000 species of lizards and with snakes, there, are, you know, there would be over 10,000 species. But what does that mean in context? Well, there are about five, over 5,000 species of mammals, for instance. That's the group that we are in. So really, they are tremendously diverse. We have things like this glass lizard that has lost its legs and looks convergent with snakes. The flying dragon we just saw. This crazy gecko that I saw in Guam this summer. Things that are as large as your forearm. This is a monitor. The list goes on. They are just amazing animals with extraordinary adaptations. And you know, romances, apparently. And some are, like this individual, are as small as the end of your thumb. And there are others that are just wild looking like this uh, animal that people like to call bipeds from Mexico that burrows into sand and lives a very underground lifestyle, lifestyle, but for some reason has these silly little arms. Uh, all right, so I wanted you guys to think about these animals and see if you know what they are. Maybe you could put it into the chat. All right, these are pretty much the only lizards that are, could be considered dangerous. And by dangerous, I mean these lizards are venomous. Um, on the left here, we have the Gila monster, which is spelled G-I-L-A monster. And on the right, we have a beaded lizard. And these are both animals that I found in the field. I found the Gila monster when I was in New Mexico and it was walking through the desert, trying to mind its own business in search of quail eggs to eat. And when I approached it, the way that it reacted was to back up, piss at me and tell me to leave it alone which is kind of funny because you often hear people saying that venomous snakes or these lizards will chase you 
and try to bite you with their venom, um, which is hilarious because a Gila monster, if it tried to chase you and it successfully bit you, that would be quite a story because they are one of the slowest animals um, when they are running. <laughs> so if somebody tries to tell you they're dangerous, well, please just don't stick your hand in their face. And then I would love to talk, tell you all about this female on the right here who I found in Oaxaca at night. She was walking around, of course, trying to forage. And when I noticed her, her response was to turn around and face me and take a stance and start to gape with her mouth like this, hissing. She started to hiss. And what you see, that white on her mouth there, that's actually foam from her, I guess, presumably showing you that, you know, she's venomous. Don't come near, leave me alone. So all I want to say is both of these animals, while they could be considered dangerous, um, overall lizards aren't. And even the ones that are dangerous, they just want you to leave them alone. Even herpetologists who love them, they wish they would, I would just leave them alone. <laughs> All right. So now that we know what lizards are, what do lizards do? Why study them? So lizards often live very different lifestyles. Some are terrestrial or in the leaf litter. Some are aquatic or stream side. Others are underground or fossorial. And I hope you notice that I drew a tiny little bipedes in this cartoon because that um, animal is fossorial or an underground animal. Others are rock dwelling. Uh, scientists use the word saxopolis for that. And finally, many are tree dwelling or arboreal. So I'll try to trick, uh, not use the jargon words here, but you will see these icons again. So remember what kind of lifestyles lizards have. All right. So what, what, now that we know some of the lifestyles that they have, uh, let's consider some of their other uh, behaviors. So lizards are predators. They are first predators. Uh, they predate things like insects and rodents. Um, they are also sometimes secondary predators. So some herps or um, lizards will actually eat other lizards. Uh, often birds are part of that, but lizards are also part of the food web and that they're prey for a lot of animals. Other herps, raccoons like to eat <laughs> herps of a variety um, and even predators that we might consider more carnivorous, like coyotes and bobcats eat lizards. And finally, in this food web chain, lizards are part of the animal or the ecosystem that gets decomposed by fungi. So these are all of the interactions that these animals are having in the food web. Well, if you, we know all of that, it's obvious the next way that they're important is they can be ecosystem health indicators because if they have such connections like this in a food web and you can monitor them in an ecosystem, you might be able to know how healthy that habitat is. And 
for instance, you all might notice this even in cities or urban areas. So if you see a lot of lizards on fences and on trees in some neighborhoods and not others, you know, that can relate to some of the predators are, that are around. Um, and actually a big thing that conservationists are talking about right now is this kind of indoor outdoor cat debate because cats really do predate some of that urban wildlife. Um, and there, lizards are also inspiration. Um, Gila monsters, which I showed you just before, their venom is used in diabetes studies, uh, in tech, geckos, adhesive abilities are used to try and find uh, products that could adhere better. And you know, finally, they're inspiration for people like me. Um, I don't just like lizards because I like being sweaty and hot and seeing them. Uh, lizards are also just an amazing case study of evolution and diversity. So if you want to study lizards, take your pick at what level of interesting evolutionary change. It can be why they're different from Tuatara all the way up to your local community. I love that picture. I'm so sweaty. It's, it's wonderful. So what I study are a group of lizards I affectionately call Euros. And Euros is actually from their scientific name, Eurosaurus ornatus. Um, their common name is the ornate tree lizard, which I think is really boring. Um, so I'm trying to rebrand them as Euros because I think that's way cooler. And what I would like you guys to notice here is the Eurosaurus or the Euro on the right has this kind of bark coloration on its back. But the ventral side of the animal was this vibrant blue. Well, as it turns out, what I've shown you here on the right is that that blue color on the throat can change or be different. In the same population, you can have animals that are green, some that are blue, others that are orange. And I don't know what this animal here is doing with the green centered throat and the orange around the outside, What's going on there? I don't know. Well, I'll tell you what problem I have. So I go into one population. I see that they have all of these throat colors, right? And then say I'm, I'm in the Davis Mountains here in Texas, and I notice this, right? Then I go clear across the United States to Yuma, Arizona. And what do I find? I find two color morphs, but I don't find others. And I go to Utah and I only see one. And I go to Chihuahua and I see three again. What is happening? And how am I at all supposed to understand this variation uh, at, in such a large area? So to do that, I'm utilizing community science. Uh, I use iNaturalist, and I'm not sure that people realize this, but what, what you do with iNaturalist is you can download it on your phone and you can have an app where when you're hiking or in nature, you can take a photograph of an animal and it will take your locality data and that then becomes an observation of that animal. And with iNaturalist, this has been awesome for me because people go ahead and catch euros and inevitably they take pictures of their uh, underside because it's so fabulous looking. And you know what? 
that has given me such an amazing uh, freedom because now I have photographs of coloration variation across this huge range that euros are in. So if I haven't sold you on iNaturalist, oh no, sorry. So iNaturalist.org is the, the website. Um, and you don't just have to help people like me with our, uh, my project. You know, a lot of those people who were adding observations of euros didn't realize that I would end up using their observation like that. So that's really fun. Um, but, you know, you can also enjoy a naturalist through the app or the website uh, just to document the local herps in your backyard. So I highly encourage you guys to look at this if you're at all interested. And also because it can help you identify animals around here. And thus, let's talk about the basics of identifying Texas blizzards. And, you know, if you get overwhelmed with any of this information, keep in mind that iNaturalist is a source for you to use to help identify the animals near you. Okay, I wanted to start with this example slide. And mostly because, unfortunately, I don't have any aquatic Texas lizards to tell you about. So here, what I want you to see is I put the common name of the animal. This is a type of a knoll. And then I put that icon. Here, it's aquatic, right? And then there's the species name under that, the scientific one. And I've included a distribution map for this animal. And what do you know? Barker's anole doesn't occur in Texas. That makes sense. It actually occurs in Mexico. But I couldn't resist showing you all at least an aquatic animal or lizard. Um, and these are really fun because they'll stick on the rocks on the side of streams. And if you scare them, they'll jump into the water, swim away, and they've actually been reported to breathe underwater using air bubbles. So these are really cool animal. I'm gonna move forward and show you several uh, groups of lizards in Texas, but it's not exhaustive. There are so many species of lizards in Texas. And I can only talk about them if I can bump them into big groups. All right, here we go. So here are the Texas anoles. Um, in Texas, we actually have green anoles and the brown anole, which is introduced. IN is how I've in indicated when an animal is introduced here. Um, anoles are arboreal. They're, you know, not much bigger than your palm lengthwise. And what's really fun and, uh, and an easy way to identify when you've seen an anole is they have dewlaps. What's a dewlap? Well, it's this throat fan extending down from um, their chin and well, mid breast here. And you can see that in the smell in the bottom photo here, he's extending his dewlap at the female anole, trying to communicate some prowess to her, trying to impress her. So you'll know when you have an anole because they have these really pointy long snouts and a dewlap. And even the females will have a dewlap too. Alligator lizards. Isn't this a gorgeous photo my friend Simon Scarpetta took? Alligator lizards, you can find them in the green belt here in Austin. Um, and they're called that because they almost look like they have those big, thick armored scales all over their body. 
like crocodilians and alligators do. But of course, they're not crocodiles or alligators. They're a lizard. Here's one that's lost its tail and it's regrowing. And, you know, these animals are really elongate. Um, and they are quite, quite a bit larger than the palm of your hand. And they're often arboreal. And if you hear, I've been told, I've been told this, if you are in the forest hiking and it's really quiet and you know, the sun is out and there's dappled lighting and you hear some, some sudden crash, that's often the best way to find an alligator lizard who's, who's fallen out of a tree. Apparently they're not that awesome at climbing. <laughs> Collared lizards. I adore collared lizards. There are two species of collared lizard in Texas. Um, here I've indicated uh, the reticulate collared lizard in yellow and then the eastern collared lizard in orange. I really like collared lizards because they're so colorful. And you know when you've seen a female and she, uh, because she has red striping on top of all this gorgeous coloration that you already see here. And I love that because how often do you hear about the female being the more colorful of the two sexes? Collared lizards are quite large actually. Um, total length can almost be the size of a ruler. Uh, so this is one of the bigger lizards you might see here in Texas. And you'd probably see it when you're out hiking and maybe you look from a distance and you see a rock that's shaped really weird at the top. Well, it's a collared lizard out basking. Um, and, the, and like I said, or like this icon shows, they are rock dwelling and they actually will hide and sleep under rocks. Earless lizards. So um, I unfortunately didn't have a great photo of um, an earless lizard. So I included here the close relative of the earless lizard, um, which is the zebra tail. And both the greater earless lizard and the zebra tail have these bandings uh, banded tails on uh, which they will actually <laughs> display at you. I don't know if you guys have been out hiking and you're in a dry stream bed, say, and you see this lizard waving a tail at you, um, almost like a raccoon tail curled up at you and it's back, black and white. And you're like, what is that? Well, actually, uh, though, that is a uh, Texas greater earless lizard. And this is a close relative I have here shown. Um, and you can tell it's not an earless lizard because if you look, it has an ear hole on the side of its head. Okay, geckos. So we have uh, three geckos and that's not including all of the introduced geckos that we have. Uh, geckos can be arboreal or tree, tree dwelling. And often when you're out hiking, you might not see them because they're actually usually nocturnal. And you guys are probably most familiar with this Mediterranean house gecko on the bottom here, which you will see around lights in Austin at night. And what they're doing is they're sitting at the lights trying to get the insects coming in that are attracted to the light. The animal I have pictured up above it is a Texas banded gecko. And it's a little bit different because you wouldn't see it running around uh, on the side of your house but actually you would more likely see it if you're out camping at night and you're shining your flashlight on a bunch of boulders, you might be so lucky as to see one of these. 
They're actually kind of small, a little bit the size of your thumb, maybe. So if you spot one, good on you because you have great eyesight. And also feel super lucky. They're an awesome animal. And it's really cool that we get uh, various banded geckos in Texas. Glass lizards. Now glass lizards are quite a treat. I haven't seen one myself yet and it makes me so sad, but my friend David Ledesma was gracious enough to let me use photos of an animal he just saw this year. And what I want you to notice is how shiny this animal looks, how it almost looks as though it has a lizard head attached to a snake body. And I kid you not, if you ask a herpetologist to tell you um, how, how they can tell a glass lizard or a legless lizard is not a snake, some of them actually say, because it has like a lizard head attached to like a snake body. Um, and why, why are they saying that? Well, it comes back to the thing I was saying about skulls again. Lizards have skulls that aren't very movable and they're more hardened. And this is true of glass lizards. Um, I really hope that I can see one one day. Um, if you wanted to, I do one of these um, because you are out in Eastern Texas, something you might need to do is look to see if it's blinking. They should have eyelids. That's another lizard trait, not a snake trait, right? Um, if, if, uh, that's if you can't just tell that it has a weird lizard head offhand. <laughs> look for the eyelids. Okay, horned lizards, everybody's favorite. Um, so here, what I, what I have in my hand is actually a Texas great horned lizard. And you can see how large it is. It's almost really the size of a toad. And I think that's kind of why people sometimes call them horny toads because they look fat and puffy like a toad would, but with horns. And you can see that that animal is really puffed up in my hand, almost looks like a stress ball with armor. And what it's doing there is it's trying to, you know, show how big it is to me. So I'll put it down. Uh, a really interesting fact about these lizards that I'm sure many of you have heard is that they do squirt blood out of their eyes at like coyotes or canids and some humans have had it happen to them. And what they're doing is they're trying to uh, make you think they're just disgusting, dead, rotten meat, like gross. You know, they want you to think that they're foul. It's a defense strategy so that you won't eat them. Um, and here, the other horned lizard we have is this cute little round-tailed horned lizard um, and thank you so much, Simon, for letting me use this photo. What I want you to notice here is that this animal is next to tiny little pebbles, right? And it almost looks like one. Man, if it wasn't zoomed up on this, I bet you'd have a hard time seeing one. And in fact, I haven't seen a little round-tailed horn lizard in six years. Ah. I, I, I probably shouldn't have admitted that out loud to so many folks, but it's the truth. They're hard to spot. So if you see a little horned, uh, a little round-tailed horned lizard, um, and sometimes if you get a little horned lizard, people think it might be a baby great uh, Texas horned lizard, but you actually might have a round tail on your hands. And so you should feel really delighted. And, and yes, also most of these lizards, most of the, are sorry, all of the horned lizards are leaf litter or terrestrial. So they're not burrowing. Why would they do that? Their horns would get caught on everything. Okay. Skinks. So skinks are 
animals that people often can get confused with uh, snakes because of their movement. This here is a little brown skink that I found in the green belt in Austin. And boy, are they hard to get to sit still. Um, this animal is pretty much the size of my pinky. It's tiny. And if you're walking in the green belt and you hear lots of rustling and things running out from under your feet and you look and you see this, this kind of like serpentine action, it's probably a skink, a little brown skink. Um, but there are eight species of skinks in, in Texas. Not all of them are as small as the little brown skink. Uh, it is certainly the smallest. One of the ways you can tell that you have a skink on your hands is they're really shiny, kind of like a glass lizard. Um, they're really smooth. Um, and they often have very long bodies and long tails with kind of scrawny legs. Oh, I get to talk about my euros again. So I put the euros with the side watch lizards because people often commonly mistake them for one another. But one of the ways you can tell if you have a Eurosaurus or a Euro versus a side blotch lizard is that side blotch lizards have that name for a reason. They'll have a black patch right under their arm, kind of where their elbow hits on their rib cage. And that's one of the best ways to tell that you have a side blotch lizard. Uh, my other personal tip is if you really want to figure out what this lizard is, because you have a lizard about, you know, you can see that euro in my hand on the right, how big these animals are. So say you have a lizard about that size. One of the things you can do to tell them apart is based on what they were doing. So in the photo, you can see the side blush lizard is on, a, on some sort of dead log on the ground. Well, side blotch lizards are really mostly terrestrial or leaf litter dwelling. And euros almost always are on rocks or up in the trees. Also, I mean, let's just be honest, euros look way cooler on the underside. All right, finally, we have whip tails. Um, there are 10 species of whiptails in Texas. Uh, and I really wanted to show you all this photo because you can just see the pupil of this animal. And the reason I want you to see that is because the eyes look crazy. They have crazy eyes. Their, their eyes are wild and their eyes reflect exactly what they behave like when you're out hiking, if you see a whip tail, it is constantly moving. It can never stop. It's so high energy. It's impossible to get a good look at it. Um, you almost have to catch it to even get a good view. And they're, uh, they're often running away from you, almost like a skink would too. But they're not afraid of you in the same way that a skink is because they know they're fast. So sometimes you'll catch one watching you actually. I just wanted to give you guys another view of a, of a whip tail here so that you can see um, how long their tails are. And actually some people uh, think that whip tail comes from their tail being like a whip because it's just so long. And there are reports of them actually using it to whip at things. And you'll know if you have a whip tail because its, it's tail can be one and a half times the length of its body. Whip tails always look like this. I, I kid you not, pretty much all whip tails everywhere across the Americas almost all look like this. And they, are not 
sitting still. They're in the leaf litter, running around everywhere, and they just cannot stop. That's how you know you have a little tail. So let's review. Um, so lizards are not snakes, but they're reptiles. But snakes are kind of lizards. They live almost everywhere. The only places you can't get a lizard are the Arctic and Antarctica. And they do a lot of things. They live in trees, they live underground, leaf litter, rocks. Um, there are even some that are highly adapted to living in water. And it's important to study them because they teach us so much about the history of life on Earth. They can tell us a lot about ecosystem health, um, how things adapt, evolutionary change, conservation. I even told you guys about tech and medicine, like what? And to cap it off, there are about 50 native species of lizards in Texas. And there are many more if you include introduced lizards. Okay, so with that, I would like to say thank you to all of my lab mates um, and friends who've helped me along the way and mentors. And I would like to acknowledge the land that we stand on and the Indigenous Peoples uh, for Indigenous Peoples Week. And I would also like to thank my funding resources. Uh, guys, thank you so much for coming out to my talk. Um, does anybody have any questions? Also, I'm gonna have some water. I hope nobody minds. Excellent job, Britt. Thank you for your, thank you for, uh, you know, coming out and, and delivering this talk. Um, as, as Britt said, you know, she's going to get a quick drink of water and now is, you know, my favorite part of the talks, you know, Britt has done an excellent job telling us, you know, about some of our native herpetofauna here in Texas, um, giving you some awesome clues on how to identify and go out into the field and see them. And so now is your chance to ask questions and, and pick Britt's brain on, on this stuff. You know, um, I'm sure Britt's excited about this too. There's, there's very few questions she can't answer about this sort of thing. So um, you can put your questions in the chat if you like. You can also unmute yourself and just ask them. We'll try to get to as many as we can. We have some folks leading off questions in the chat here. Um, the first one, Britt, for you is, uh, how did Bran and, uh, Brown and Knowles get introduced into Texas? Oh, that's a great question. So actually, Anoles tend to lay their eggs in nursery plants. And what happens is anoles are, brown anoles are actually from Cuba. And plants that are beautiful and interesting that grow in, in those areas um, aren't, are transported to nurseries around Texas. And what happens is it's not just the plant, it's also the anole eggs. So pretty quickly you have this introduced species. And so in brown anoles actually, um, they're not adapted to the climate of Texas in the same way that green anoles are. So what happens uh, in those deep freezes is there's actually a huge die off of brown anoles. And there has been a few studies on that. Um, they, they die off so much that they, uh, their distribution shrinks in Texas after some of those uh, winter freezes that we get. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, the follow up question, Britt, to this is. Uh, and I think this is a really interesting question. What gives lizards the ability to regrow their tail? You know, and vis-a-vis -vis they're, they're asking, why can't mammals regrow their, their appendages uh, like, like lizards can? Oh yeah, that's, that's a great question. So lizards actually have some mechanisms in their tail that allow them to do that. And what, what we call them as uh, herpetologist is fracture planes. So if you go to grab a lizard's tail, 
where the vertebrae is, it'll actually fracture naturally just from like muscle con contraction that they themselves can execute. And it's called autotomy, um, fun word. And there's definitely some things humans lack, like uh, what limb do we have that you can just lose half of it? You know, we don't really have a limb like that. So I hope that answers some of your question, but part of the answer is, you know, we just don't have structures that we can drop off and lose and then grow back over time. And we certainly don't have the genetic machinery to do that, such as um, salamanders do, for instance. Some salamanders do have that genetic machinery. Very cool. Uh, a, a next question for you, Britt, is um, what, what is your favorite lizards other than those in the, the Eurosaurus genus? Oh, I don't. I feel like it's kind of a cop out, but I really, really love uh, Gila monsters because you can get them in New Mexico. So it's like my home state and they're absolutely ridiculous. They're so unique. Um, and I think they just kind of seem charismatic when you see them lounging around in even in zoos. And I think it's pretty wild that they have venom. Uh, and every time I've ever seen one when I've been doing field work, they always kind of stand their ground in this very charismatic way that I cannot deny. Also, orange is my favorite color and a lot of Cuba monsters are orange and black. I didn't think that was a cop-out answer at all. That was very cool. Uh, Alexa, nine years old, wants to know what the smallest lizard in the world is and what the largest lizard in the world is. Yeah, that's a great question, Alexa. Um, so the smallest lizard in the world is actually um, a chameleon um, from Madagascar. And it is absolutely tiny. You have to Google this. You'll see them uh, in the Google photos on the tip of people's thumbs. That is how tiny they are. Um, and the largest lizard are uh, Komodo dragons. They can be 10 feet, you know, this length of a wall. Think about that. Um, and that's a really cool feature of lizards as a group, actually. Thank you for asking that question. It's because of their, uh, cold-blooded lifestyle, that they are both constrained to those sizes, but can obtain such tiny sizes. Uh, uh, this is a question from uh, Ross. He's asking, do brown and green anoles hybridize at all here in Texas? Oh, that's a fun question, Ross. Thank you. Yeah, actually, um, Brown and green anoles are uh, diverged enough, meaning that their most recent ancestor has been separated long enough that they are completely incapable of interbreeding. Um, they're both from Cuba, and that's maybe a, a, another reason why, because if they evolved in the same place together, you know, which is Cuba, then they also evolved the ability to isolate from each other and become separate things. Our next question uh, here in the chat um, is, let me see here. Uh, uh, Kate is asking what the lizard with the longest lifespan is. How, how long can uh, the, the longest lived lizard live, Britt? Oh my gosh, what a great question. Shoot, I think I might actually have to, would be guessing if I, if I answered that. I do know that um, although it's not a lizard and this wasn't what you were asking for, um, 
the tuatara that I was telling you about earlier, there are animals that have reached the age of 100 years old and plus. And they actually aren't even able to mate in a lot of cases until they're about 20. So they're a lot like humans in their life cycle, actually. But yeah, lizards. Oh man, what a great question. Thanks for asking that. I'm gonna have to look that up. Uh, Ashley is asking you, Britt, um, a little, if she wants to know a little bit about um, the parthenogenic life cycle of, I'm assuming this is Anolis neomexicanus. Um, and she's asking how parthenogenic lizards uh, can maintain genetic diversity where there's populations with no males. Maybe uh, also explain, you know, what parthenogenesis is for everyone too, if you wouldn't mind, Britt. Yeah, what an intellectual question. Thank you for that. Um, also, I get to talk about the New Mexican whiptail. So, oh, wonderful. Um, yeah, so there's actually several parthenogenic whiptails in New Mexico, um, Arizona, and Northern Mexico. And what parthenogenic means is asexual. This, this is an animal that clones itself. And only female lizards are capable of doing this. Right, so what the female does is actually when she is of reproductive age, um, kind of, she just, her biological clock goes off and she goes, well, I wanna clone myself now. Makes a little clone. And what you get are a bunch of animals with the same genetic material. So that was part of the question, which is, how do they get genetic diversity? Well, you know, honestly, the best way for a parthenogenic animal like that to get genetic diversity, um, it, it, there really isn't a good one because there needs to be interbreeding in order for there to be new combinations of things. Um, you can have a more diverse, genetic population of, say, Aspidocillus neomexicana, like you said, uh, the New Mexico whiptail, um, from, this, this is like going way overboard with the answer, by the way, but the reason we get parthenogens at all is because a lot of whiptails, um, non-parthenogenic species, ones that are not asexual, interbreed, and they make an animal that can clone itself. So you have to think of the two ancestral species interbreeding and making that asexual animal. So that's how you could get a population with a little bit of genetic diversity because the two um, original species that create the asexual animal um, you know, happen to bump into each other again and make another weird asexual uh, whip tail. But honestly, uh, those parthenogenic species are not um, really genetically diverse. And that's one of the reasons people wonder if they're able to um, maintain for a long time, um, how long could those species exist if they're, they're just going to uh, keep cloning themselves and have no genetic diversity and say, oh, I don't know, a crazy freeze, like the one we just had in Austin came through. Are they going to have uh, the ability to adapt to that? Well, you know, probably not. So the, the theory goes that those asexual species will kind of um, blink out as fast as they blink in, so to say. That was a lot. I'm done. Oh, that, that, that was great, Britt. Fascinating. Thank you for, for that. Uh, Susan has uh, a question about annals in her yard. She said up to about 10 years ago, she had some in her front yard, but she hasn't seen any lately. She doesn't use any pesticides, and she wants to know, Britt, if, if you might have any ideas on where they might have gone. Yeah, so, okay. I'm assuming your, your yard is in Austin. Maybe it isn't, but 
I'm also assuming that you are seeing the green anole a lot. And in both cases, you know, of a green or a brown anole, remember how I was talking about those freezes? Well, there were die-offs even in the green anole population because those winter freezes are just really extreme. You know, something that um, not all of the species that are used to Texas climate, or not all of the individuals that are used to Texas climate quite have the genetic material to adapt to or, you know, find a way out of. So that's one answer for you. But green anoles are still around. You just got to give them a second to rebound. Um, another one that I don't know if you can do much about is if there's been a recent influx of people that keep outdoor cats. Um, if you got a new neighbor in with an outdoor cat or several, that's a big way to lose your local birds, your urban birds and your urban lizards. Um, and you know, one of the things you can do if that is true is you know, have a little chit chat with that person and ask them to put a bell on the animal ask them to put um, colorful collars on their cats because lizards have amazing eyesight. I don't know if I showed you guys enough colors on lizards in this presentation. I hope you did, but uh, hopefully you, you saw enough of the colors to realize that they have great vision. So, you know, those are two things you could probably ask your neighbor. The best thing would honestly be to consider keeping their cat indoor um, since it's not part of the uh, natural or you know, urban wildlife community ecosystem here. Uh, I, hope, I hope that answers your questions about the uh, anoles in your, your front yard, Susan. Uh, we have a couple questions from Miles here, who's 11 years old. He seems very interested in uh, regrow the ability of lizards uh, to regrow parts of their bodies. He's, he's firstly curious if lizards can regrow other body parts than just their tails. And he also wants to know what makes certain lizards nocturnal and certain lizards active during the day. Those are great questions. Yeah, so lizards really can't regrow other limbs or other parts of their body. It's really just their tails. Um, if you want to learn more about animals that can regrow parts of their body that aren't just their tails, definitely look into salamanders. You will go wild. Um, you know, people have, I have a friend, um, he's actually pictured here in this photo, grabbing water out of this little pond here, uh, Reuben. And Reuben actually keeps salamanders. And one of his salamanders got in a little scuffle with another salamander. And what happened was it lost its arm. Well, good thing it was a salamander because I think within a month, it had already started to regrow this tiny little nubbin. And, you know, eventually its whole arm completely grew back, every digit and all. Um, Lizards actually, the regrow ability is really different from what salamanders do because salamanders can regrow the bones and the skin, cartilage, and muscles in their uh, limbs. But what happens when lizards regrow their tail is they can they've lost the vertebrae that makes those tails um, rigid or is a, allows them to. Um, take more control of their tail. And what happens is all they grow back, when you see a lizard tail that looks kind of funky and then like it's probably regrown, um, part of that is because the scales even grew back differently. There's no vertebrae and it's all like um, fat that they're storing. So, that, so lizards actually use their tail for, you know, kind of like, we use the fat on our body. It's a resource to store nutrients and energy. Um, and so that's why also it's great to grow your tail back because when you hit hard times, you have something to depend on. Um, okay, so did I get all of that 
please help me, Tristan. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I, his second question was about whether or not, uh, what makes certain lizards nocturnal and what makes certain lizards live during the day? Yes, that's great. That's a great question. So uh, geckos are actually a fascinating example of nocturnal adaptation. And part of the, the way that lizards seemingly become nocturnal versus diurnal or um, really operating during the day is various eyesight changes happen where they can see better in the dark. Um, but you know, that also limits their activity during the day because if you, could you just imagine, it would be like, have you ever been inside of a dark movie theater and your eyes got really adapted to the screen? And then all of a sudden you walk out of the movie theater after the movie's over and you get this kind of like pain in your eyes because it's so bright outside. Well, you know, imagine that you were a gecko with all of these vision adaptations for darkness. Uh, why it would not be helpful for you to be active during the day because you actually can't see that great in those settings anymore. Um, so that's, you know, one thing that uh, nocturnal lizards really need is, is some sort of adaptations to seeing in the dark. Or if you're a fossorial animal that lives underground, you just forget eyesight, daytime, all of that, throw it all to the wayside and do whatever you want any time of day because your eyes are reduced you don't care about light, what does it matter? <laughs> oh, how cool, Britt. Thank you again. Uh, we, have an, we have a question from Ian, who's 11 years old in Mexico. I'm doing some translation on the fly here, but I think Ian's asking, you know, uh, when you've been to Mexico, what was, the, what was your favorite lizards you saw there? Oh, hi, Ian. Hi, Cynthia. Hi, Yael, Nanak. So glad you're here. Um, that was my family from Mexico calling. Um, yeah, Ian, my favorite lizard. Okay, so I actually think that it's an anole. Sorry, if that's not what you wanted to hear. I really, really love Peter's eye. Uh, Peter's eye is this really big, you know, anole the size of my palm, just just from its snoot to its butt. And then its tail is as long as my uh, arm here. It's a large and all. You see them often in the treetops, hanging from twigs and at, at night when they're sleeping. And I just, I just love them because they have these big toe pads, almost like a gecko. It's an anole being like a gecko, what is it doing? And it's the wrong size to be an anole. It's just massive. But actually there's, you know, almost 500 species of anoles. So that's a whole other topic. They can be any size they want apparently. But my, one of my favorite anoles and lizards in Mexico is seeing a Peter's eye. It's just such a delight and so special. And the best thing about him is if you grab them and pick them up, uh, and you pull out their dewlap because those dewlaps are so sweet. I keep talking about them. They have patterns on their throat that you can ID to the individual. Isn't that great? You can, you can use their dewlap as like a fingerprint. I love that. We, we have another question now for you, Britt, um, that might be uh, also kind of close to home. Uh, this is from Maya, who's also from New Mexico. She's from the Rio Rancho area. Uh, and she's asking, uh, she's, she says there were many lizards in her area growing up. And she's curious how the diversity of lizards there in, in New Mexico and maybe Rio Rancho um, compared to the diversity of, of lizards elsewhere you've studied. That's an awesome question. I love that you asked it. So, all right, the diversity of lizards in New Mexico is different than here. And partly that's because there's a lot of arid adapted 
uh, animals. So animals that are really like ready for dry weather. And New Mexico is pretty much the center of whiptail diversity. So if you ever walk outside and think, you know, I thought I knew what a whiptail looked like, but this one looks so different from the other one I saw just a half second ago. Well, if you're in New Mexico, what's happening to you is you're probably seeing, I think one of the uh, dozens of species that occurs there. And that's including those parthenogenic species that we were just talking about and species that are um, sexual. So New Mexico has a lot of diversity uh, for arid adapted lizards, but the highest diversity of lizards I've ever seen has to be in the tropics. I've, I've been to Panama, uh, Belize, uh, Southern Mexico, Guatemala. These areas have uh, just tremendous diversity of things that live in the canopy, you know, of the, the forest. They have all of those tree uh, tree dwelling animals that are using a lower part of the tree. That's another level of diversity those lizards have. Then there's another whole set that just hang out on grasses and vines. Like, you know, there's so many surfaces to try and be a different kind of lizard in the tropics. Um, but there's just not that many microhabitat, as we like to say, in, in drier areas. So the tropics is definitely the center of diversity for you know, most animals, but certainly lizards too. I can, I can definitely uh, attest to that with some other organisms like what Britt was saying. Uh, the next question we have, and you know, it's, it's getting kind of late, but I love having questions. So we'll if you <laughs> feel free to stick around. Um, Britt, you, do you mind answering a few more questions? Sure, yeah, let's go. Uh, yeah. Great. Uh, so this this next question comes from uh, I recognize she's one of my old students, and of course, you know, hopefully I did them well. Uh, she's asking a really cool question that I would love to know the answer to, Britt. She's asking if there are any lizards uh, that can see into spectra that humans cannot, like infrared or ultraviolet. Wow, I can't believe you just asked that. That's pretty much what my dissertation is about. Wonderful. <laughs> So actually euros are an example of an animal that I think uses uh, spectra that humans can't see. But the truth is most birds and lizards see in spectra that humans cannot. Humans see invisible light. I know people probably hear that a lot, but other animals like birds and lizards can see into the UV uh, part of the spectra. And that's kind of what gives you that sunburn, you know? So imagine you could see that, right? And then there's even infrared that some birds can see. Well, what's really neat is not just that lizards can see other spectra, but it's that they can use it also. So, Part of the questions that I'm trying to ask with those dewlaps, with those colors that the lizards are using, is to see if they're using not just what we can see in human vision, but also if they're using part of their spectra, uh, spectra, oh, I can't talk, uh, to, to communicate with one another, to communicate uh, to other species of lizards, even maybe to try and deter birds. We don't know any of those questions. They're not answered. Gosh, what that that is a that's a great question there, Paige. That was so cool, Britt. Yeah. Uh, right there, related to the work you're doing. How very exciting. We have another cool question coming to you. This is from one of the officers of the of the undergraduate ecology, evolution, and behavior club here at, at the University of Texas. This is from Elena. She's asking, uh, how does the horned lizard blood shooting defense mechanism work physically? Um, and she's, she's also asking, are there any costs to the, to the lizard from using this defense? Yeah, Elena, great. So 
the, the mechanism with which they use to spurt the blood. Um, I have a vague recollection of it. That's something like, you know, they squeeze muscles and their tear ducts and shoot it out. So I don't want to like, you know, be incorrect totally on that. Uh, I, so I'm, I'll, I'm gonna have you look that up just to clarify, but I think it has something to do with them um, contracting the muscles near where their tear ducts would be and then, or um, sorry, where their eye muscles are and it actually squirts out near like the side of their eyeballs. It's something wild. You should look it up, it's crazy. Um, for your second question, yes, most certainly. What an awesome question, which is yes, if an animal just like the tail is losing something, if it's losing blood or, you know, this kind of foul substance mixed with blood, that cost it something. It was resources. It used its food that it worked hard to get to make that substance. And now it's losing it instead of being able to retain it and keep the resources that went into making it. So yes, definitely they are, they are losing something there. They can replenish that, um, you know, so it's, it's not like they've lost it forever, the, the blood resource, but you know, it's gonna, it's gonna be costly and they might have to work a little bit harder for a few of their mills or whatever. Thanks for that question. Yeah, awesome question, Elena, thank you. Um, we have a question now from Steve. And Steve remembers growing up in East Texas as a, as a kid in the 60s. And, and he says he has memories of seeing Texas horned lizards out there. He's curious if they used to be that far east or perhaps he was seeing a different taxa. Yeah, actually. Um, so I had a conversation with the museum curator here. Um, his name is Travis LeDuc. Uh, he's a museum curator for the herpetology department here at the Texas Natural History Collection. And um, one of the things Travis was, you know, sad to, to chit chat with me about upon seeing, you know, some of my slides was that my distribution map for uh, horned lizards was now true because before they, they were more easterly, apparently. Um, I think there are some hypotheses about this that have to do with some of the um, invasive ants uh, because almost all horned lizards are exclusive ant eaters. Um, so there's the invasive ants have toxins and you know Tristan knows way more about ants than I do so I should tread lightly here but basically uh, horned lizards are adapted to properly sequester toxins from ants so that they don't get sick and impacted negatively by those chemicals. But invasive ants or introduced ants are animals that they are not adapted to. So that's one thought. And also, as we know, the climate is changing. And one of the big things is if you go uh, already, we all probably know this, east of Austin is more grassland. And you know, west of it, we've got the hill country. And that's one of the other things that can change just with climate change is habitat uh, encroachment of grasslands and things like that. So yeah, you are asking uh, an important question and a conservation-related question. Mm. To, to add real quick, Britt, you, you're absolutely right that, that um, the introduction of these invasive fire ants um, is probably fire ants, but there could be others. Yes. Uh, what's, what's happening, you know, uh, firstly, Britt is exactly correct. These fire ants have an entire different chemical suite that is probably not at all effective or useful for the digestive system of these horned lizards. But the other thing these ants are doing is they're, they're out competing the, the native ants that the horned lizards can eat. So it's kind of a double whammy here where these invasive ants are, you know, unpalatable and, and not useful chemically for the lizard's digestive system. 
And then they also are ruining the ants that are useful for the, the digestive system. Um, yeah. But yeah, Britt is absolutely correct about that. Mm -hmm. um, we have another question for you now, Britt, um, from Kate. She's asking, um, do different lizard species sort of have different personalities? This is a fun question. I like this one. I do too. And I'm all for anthropomorphizing animals or non non-human animals more correctly. And, you know, like I was saying earlier, my favorite species to encounter is the Gila monster because it's just so uh, defensive or, you know, it takes a stand. And I think I, I, I admire that kind of bravery, you know, but really what, as a scientist, what you're supposed to do and think about is not how they might be feeling emotionally because we really just don't know, honestly. I mean, maybe somebody's gonna uh, figure that science out within the next century. But at present, what we do know is, well, what kind of morphological and physiological adaptations are associated with a Gila monster standing its ground? Um, you might have seen some of the skinks in the green belt. What's associated with them scurrying away? Um, often you'll see those blue tails flashing in the leaf litter. And you could say that they have really skittish personalities, maybe, but that's you know anthropomorphizing, right? And we don't actually know. But what we do know is that that blue coloration of a skink tail is very bright to all other lizards, snakes, birds. They can see it very well. And hey, as it turns out, if you give any of those predators a blue skink tail or a brown skink head, they pick the blue tail because it's more visually obvious. So, you know, I don't know, unfortunately we can't say much about personality, but we can say when they're doing something that reminds us of our personality traits, it's probably related to the tools that they have, you know, the morphological and adaptive tools that they possess. Thanks for that question. That's so fun to think about. And a very insightful answer too, Britt. Very, very cool. Um, we have another question from Ross. Uh, he's asking, have any Texas lizards been studied to determine uh, if they glow under ultraviolet light or, or in the dark? You know, this is, this is related to what we maybe were talking about earlier with Paige's question. Yeah, that's a fun question. So right now, um, people are starting to get really excited about color science and um, the spectra we can't see. And we're starting to think more about how animals actually perceive their world that aren't humans, which is fun, because then we can start asking the questions you are. Um, but then there's hurdles we have to get over, because that means we're trying to study something we can't see. Every time humans try to do that, they have to invent intense tools and softwares and et cetera, et cetera. So very recently, I actually obtained a camera that's been modified so that it can see um, or it can absorb light from all the spectra. And what that does is it takes a photo of the world in a way I can't see it personally, but it does record that information and give me a little bit of info about maybe how lizards are seeing. Um, so for instance, you asked about UV light. Well, lizards actually, if they can see UV, what's happening is they can bounce parts of their body. And actually the blue urosaurus uses UV light to bounce light off of its color badge there on its throat, its dewlap. And it looks probably even brighter to conspecifics, to other urosaurus. And my photos indicate that it does look brighter. If you take a picture in only UV with UV light, 
not only is this animal vibrant and blue in the visible spectrum, but it's bright, blaring white in the UV spectrum. Gosh, is that wild? It's even brighter than it already is in the visible. That's insane. I think it is. It's so cool. So people are asking those questions right now, and particularly to do with how lizards are using light to camouflage even better than we realize, perhaps, or to communicate more efficiently with other conspecifics or um, as predator deterrents, right? So those are two thoughts. Do lizards glow? So glowing is a bit different than using UV because UV is, it, you know, you can think of it more like the visible spectrum and that visible light bounces on to you and then it bounces off and that's why we can see the colors we do. Well, what happens when an animal glows is they actually absorb the light from part of the spectra and they release it from the lower part of the spectrum. Um, so that's kind of, that's what hap that's what's happening when animals glow, and you know really like lizards don't truly glow. That's like a, a you know underwater marine mammal kind of thing, or you know jellyfish or some of those like biofilms. They're absorbing light and then releasing it out at a different uh, spectra. Um, yeah, there are substances though, like bone. So if there was like exposed bone, um, in certain cases, it can uh, interact with light in kind of a funky glow sort of way. But yeah, there's not really glowing lizards. But I mean, maybe lizards are glowing to each other just using UV, I don't know. Thank you for that. Your enthusiasm is giving me chills, Britt. Thank you for Cool, such cool responses. Um, it's awesome to see see someone get so excited about such cool cutting edge science. Um, we've got we've got uh, uh, along those lines. We've got a really cool science question for you here, uh, a little bit more in depth perhaps um, from Ashley. She's asking with the infra specific variation of Euro coloring. Have you noticed an impact of this on color and fitness? Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a fun question. And you know, what I can say to that is people long before me realized that euros were pretty neat and having all of those different color morphs. And what they did is they did a few studies where they tried to see if different colors were different sizes or weights. Um, and why am I talking about size and weight? Well, I'm talking about size and weight because often that's a really easy way to kind of try to get a proxy or something similar to whatever the word fitness means. However fit an animal is, um, you could say it's related to how much uh, resources they can store in their body. And that would be related to their length and their weight, right? So with that in mind, um, actually, the researchers found that among the different colored euros, there's no difference in the size that they can be. So with that, our next logical leap could be, well, the euro different colors don't lead to different fitness. But that was in that population. Have we been able to ask if different environments, like more arid habitats, such as New Mexico versus some of the more temperate uh, shrublands that we get in Texas, are the euros there um, impacted differently because of their surroundings, because of their light environment, because of their predator environment? Are they impacted differently? Um, gosh, I don't know. Yeah, maybe, maybe an orange color Euro, for instance, isn't as fit in a Texas habitat. But that's the next question, right? I, we need to do that. I need to do that. 
Thanks for that question. That was really fun. I think uh, unless anyone has any quick last minute questions they want to sneak in there, you know, uh, Britt, I'd love to share some of the appreciation from the chat. You know, people want to thank you the world over, and I must agree with them. A super enjoyable talk. They're really grateful for you answering the questions. And again, you know, we all very much appreciate you taking the time to come and share your expertise and your excitement and your passion with, with all of us. Um, Again, I'd like to, you know, you can uh, drop your appreciation again in the chat. I'll give you a little bit of an applause here. Again, Britt, um, thank you again for giving this talk. Yeah. Uh, I'll say a quick few things before everyone wants to leave. I know it's getting kind of late, so I won't take up too much time. Our next talk will be November 11th. Uh, we'll have yet another awesome herpetologist coming to talk to us. Um, yeah, that was Ruben Tovar. He's going to talk about cave dwelling salamanders on the next uh, edition of Science Under the Stars. Thanks to everyone who came out. Big thanks, of course, to Britt and the other organizers of Science Under the Stars. Um, excellent job, Britt. Uh, everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you, everyone. This was so much fun. Have a great evening. <laughs>